Martin Scorsese's classic film, The Taxi Driver, is the zeitgeist of a crestfallen generation. It was the first of its kind, the culmination of all that came before, and an unwitting blueprint for a forthcoming age of filmmaking. More than a movie, it was a movement. A cinematic revolution. Actor Robert De Niro stars in this taut and tawdry tale of the turmoil of urban decay, playing the role of the Euronymous Travis Bickle, our protagonist turned antagonist turned protagonist. The film is, on the surface, a poignant critique of Western identitarianism in a post-aspirational ethrostate, but beyond that, it is, at its core, the tragic story of a mentally ill loner, Travis the taxi driver, and his struggles in a society that he can't, or won't, understand. This monumental tale, as old as time, follows Travis on his quest for redemption, or perhaps, purpose. Abandoned by society and treated like trash by the people he cares for most, Travis defies the odds and defines himself with his convictions, becoming the unlikely hero of the broken, the beaten, and the damned. Before we go any further, I need to point out that this movie is not for modern audiences. If that's you, if you're a modern audience, please leave the video now. You're not going to be spoon-fed the plot. You're not going to be able to pay attention to the movie. You're frankly not prepared for this movie. It should stick to playing Far Cry or something. As YouTube commenter at user ps 4 gv 7 ge 6 t pointed out, this is a movie that you can only understand if you're watching it at 3 a.m. There's no hand-holding here. The film isn't going to immerse you into Travis's mental or emotional state. You need to put in the effort to understand this movie. Immerse yourself in insomnia. That's why I'm recording this video at 3 a.m. I get up at 3 a.m. every day and watch Taxi Driver because it's the only way that I can truly grasp the mind of Travis Bickle. If you were to watch this movie while mentally alert or conscious, you might miss the subtle details in the script and cinematography, the visual storytelling. A casual viewing this movie might ask, why is Travis attempting to kill a sitting U.S. Senator while wearing a jacket that has his name written on the back? A sleep-deprived viewer, on the other hand, will instead ask, why is Travis? Who put him here? And for what purpose? That's what Taxi Driver is all about, and that's exactly the subtlety that modern cinema is lacking. In the eyes of God, we are married. But please don't. Do this to me. I love him. This is the sort of movie that comes only once in a lifetime. A movie so great that Martin Scorsese made it not once, but twice. A stroke of genius. Other directors just can't compare, putting out virtually the same movie multiple times, and worse, never creating anything truly original, only venturing to adapt existing stories from comics and books. Following the unmitigated success of Taxi Driver, Martin Scorsese again joined forces with Robert De Niro to bring us King of Comedy, the spiritual successor to the titular film. Every bit as good as Taxi Driver in its own right, King of Comedy not only revisited the concepts and themes we were familiar with from the earlier film, but recaptured the minutia, drawing us back into the minds of both Travis Bickle and his Neolithic counterpart, the enigmatic Rupert Pupkin. In this film, we follow the struggling comedian Rupert as he tries to kickstart his career by impressing his comedy idol, through increasingly dubious means, all the while lost in his own elaborate fantasies of success. As the film progresses, we're left to wonder just what's real, and whether Rupert can step outside of his dreams long enough to really seize them in the waking world. An insomniac, eager to wake. The lingering influences of a powerhouse film like this simply cannot be understated. In short, the movie is a masterpiece. It leaves a mark on cinema felt to this day. A scar that never heals. So let's take a look now at 2013's The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. In this piece, Ben Stiller, or should I say, Ben Stiller, delivers a fantastic performance as Walter Mitty, the caliber of which we've come to expect from his earlier outings. As for the film itself, it's a fine movie overall. Though it really ought to be carried by the strength of the leading man, it really falters in its execution as this film unexpectedly lifts many of its themes and plot points from King of Comedy and, by extension, Taxi Driver. Throughout the film, we see our main character experiencing elaborate fantasies, trying to impress an older mentor character in his professional field, striving to find a sense of purpose in a world that abandons him and treats him like trash. There's even a female character who serves as a love interest for our socially awkward protagonist, and he shapes his personality and music tastes around her recommendations. 
Sure. You know what you remind me of? What? That song by Chris Christopherson. Who's that? The songwriter. He's a prophet. He's a prophet and a pusher. Partly truth, partly fiction. Walking contradiction. You're saying that about me? That song, Major Tom, back there when the beard guy was... He doesn't know what he's talking about. That song is about courage and going into the unknown. It's a cool song. It's not exactly subtle. Upon the mention of this song, Travis goes to pick up the record in a vain attempt to fit in, become the common man, the sort of man Betsy yearns for. Walter Mitty does much the same in his film, grabbing his Walkman and listening to Major Tom throughout the movie, desperately parroting Travis Bickle's plight. And while the film may be a ripoff of Taxi Driver, and let's be clear, it is a shameless ripoff of Taxi Driver, enough is done with the tone of the film to give it its own distinct voice so that these borrowed aspects aren't immediately apparent on a first watch. Despite the looming sense of desperation and yearning, the film generally plays us for laughs, serving as a more wholesome and lighthearted vehicle for the same themes that we're familiar with. The lingering influence of Taxi Driver is a tad less transparent with a feature like Nightcrawler, released the following year. This movie also lifts both the themes and major plot elements from the Scorsese classic, but unlike Walter Mitty, it goes a step further and attempts to mimic the dark tone of the original as well. The end product is a cheap facsimile of Taxi Driver, albeit unintentionally, as it is far from the first film to pull a stunt like this. Director Dan Kilroy clearly took heavy inspiration from the 1993 box office flop Fallen Down, which was itself a blatant ripoff of Taxi Driver, but we'll get to that a little later. First, I'd like to highlight another film that came out the very same year. Whiplash is a pretty good movie, but while watching, it's again impossible to separate it from the plot points pilfered straight from Taxi Driver and King of Comedy by proxy. Whiplash is the story of Andy Newman and his struggles to make a name for himself as a jazz musician in a society that's abandoned the genre and treats him like trash. He finds hope in this larger-than-life father figure character who represents everything he wants to achieve as well as the means to achieve it. His social awkwardness sabotages his chances with his love interest after a particularly bad date. If that all sounds a little familiar, it should. Yeah, I mean, I come and they, you know, th this is not so bad. Taking me to a place like know. this is about as exciting to me as saying, let's fuck. With you. And the similarities don't end there. There will be no more pills, there will be no more bad food, no more destroyers of my body. From now on, it will be total organization. Every muscle must be tight. Nightcrawler, meanwhile, is the story of a mentally ill loner trying to kickstart his career in journalism through increasingly dubious means. Sound familiar yet? It's a gritty tale of a desperate man eager to make a name for himself even if it means getting his hands dirty. It's a dark movie about a psychopath who doesn't sleep at night, and instead drives around the city at all hours in an iconic car that becomes the center of the protagonist's worldview. It's so transparently derivative of Taxi Driver, it's a miracle they didn't just have him drive around in a fucking taxi. Everything about this movie, even down to the title, Nightcrawler. First of all, it's not even slightly subtle, telling you before you even watch the film exactly what it's about, because filmgoers these days can't think for themselves. Just looking at the name, Nightcrawler, you already know that somebody's going to crawl about the streets at night, presumably in a car that you drive. It's one step away from just being titled Taxi Driver. It conveys the exact same motif. Between this movie and Whiplash... What do you do? I go to Fordham. What do you study? I don't have a major yet. But like, what do you want to study? Do you like the place you work in? We've got some good people working for us. And I think Palantine's got a good chance. You know you have beautiful eyes. I like the dark makeup on your eyes. I also like the way you smell. How you doing? Listen, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the, the other night. I didn't know that was the way you felt about it. Look, I, I'm really sorry about everything. I know that's not you know, enough, but I'm, I'm just really sorry. Um, would you like to have uh, some dinner uh, with me um, in the next, you know, few days or something? 
Well, how about just a cup of coffee? I come by the, uh, the headquarters or something, and we could. Uh... Like a JVC thing, and I didn't know if maybe you'd want to go, and we, you know, maybe get some like pizza afterwards, and. Okay. 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 Yeah. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for a job. You want to work uptown tonight, South Bronx, Harlem? we we'll work anytime, anywhere. We work Jewish holidays? Anytime, anywhere. I'm a hard worker. I set high goals, and I've been told that I'm persistent. At a point, it's hard to keep calling these similarities. It's just plagiarism. But buckle your seatbelts, dear viewers, because it does get worse. Let me offer you a riddle. What do you get when you cross the themes of Taxi Driver and the plot of King of Comedy with a popular comic book character? Specifically, a certain popular character from the Batman comics. <laughs> I'll give you a second to think. I'm Batman. 2022's The Batman was hailed upon release as a breath of fresh air in a decaying industry. It's been praised incessantly for its originality and creativity, though these couldn't be further from the truth. The plot's pretty straightforward. It's a story about a vigilante who stalks the streets at night using custom-made gadgets to fight criminals. Let me repeat that. It's a story about a vigilante who stalks the streets at night using gadgets to fight crime. Whereas Travis Pickle is a hero who brought justice to society, Bruce Wayne, by comparison, is the exact same character with the exact same worldview and the exact same monologue. Thursday, October 31st. May 10th. Thank God for the rain, which has helped wash away the garbage and the trash off the sidewalks. The city streets are crowded for the holiday. Even with the rain. Someday a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. Hidden in the chaos is the element, waiting to strike like snakes. All the animals come out at night. Whores, skunk pussies, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies. Murder, robberies, assault. Sick, venal. The city's eating itself. This city here is... Like an open sewer, you know? It's full of filth and scum. Maybe it's beyond saving. I think that the president should just clean up this whole mess here. He should just flush it right down the fucking toilet. Some men just want to watch the world burn. As film critic Doritos97 said, for people who thought that Batman was an original story, here's the father. Hey, Gabby, you can't park here. like everybody else, pal. Now, unlike Taxi Driver, a movie that actually takes its time to slowly develop its characters and shows us how they logically become mass shooters, Batman just gish gallops from one Taxi Driver rip-off action scene to another. Step out of your vehicle and surrender peacefully. Time's up. What is that, a bazooka? And then the movie just slows way the fuck down to give the audience time to tie their bib on so they can be spoon-fed the plot like a damn toddler. Harvey, the last man that they appointed to protect the Republic was named Caesar, and he never gave up his power. Okay, fine. You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. So in addition to just shot-for-shot shot copying this scene directly from King of Comedy, they, have, they just have Batman look straight into the camera and explain the entire theme of King of Comedy to the audience, with all the subtlety of a rotting fucking flower. And then there's this scene where Harvey Dent just shoots a guy in the back of the head, and, and like it's not even subtle, and there's no blood because it's PG-13, and it's racist. 
all of the black people in this movie are portrayed as criminals, and then this is like the only black guy in the whole movie, and he only exists so that the main character can kill him off because Batman is a fucking racist. All anyone cares about in this place are these white, privileged assholes. The movie predictably has Batman fall in love with a woman of color because that was the same dynamic that worked with Rita and King of Comedy, but they don't even grasp what made this work in the original film. And of course, the relationship doesn't work out because he's an incel. Uh, uh, from substantial and cohort he, of incels with rings. Incels. Yeah. He, he really... I'm so sick of these movies. Just every director's like, oh, I've got a, a, a great original idea. I'm going to make a dark, gritty, dramatic movie about a male character in a city with mental problems who's an incel. And there's a female character and a car. It's like the blueprint for every movie that's come out since Taxi Driver. Bruce Wayne, Louis Bloom, Andy Newman, William Foster, Rambo, Senka, Ben Stiller. Just, just make the character an incel and that'll magically make it a real movie like Taxi Driver was. And you know that these directors all had a point at which they could have written in a sex scene, but instead they chose not to do that so that their character could be an incel because they think that'll make their movie more like Taxi Driver, when in reality, all it really does is make their movie more like King of Comedy because they don't have any original ideas. Falling Down is another movie about this incel who's upset that his wife doesn't want to hang out, so he gives a Taxi Driver speech and shoots people just like Travis Bickle because creativity is dead. The director thinks that just by giving the protagonist Protagonist a daughter that this somehow makes the movie unique, but she's really just a ripoff of the daughter character from King of Comedy. And then there's this guy who's pretty much just a Travis Bickle knockoff, and then they do the golf cart scene. Now, a movie like American Psycho, while some aspects do feel somewhat derivative of Scorsese's work, makes strides in the evolution of the medium. Serving as a stimulating character study of the titular Patrick Bateman, the movie invites us into the mind of a madman. There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction. But there is no real me, only an entity. Narrative vehicles like the inner monologue of Patrick Bateman are a tasteful callback to the successes of Taxi Driver, just as the immersive hallucination sequences pay welcome tribute to King of Comedy. And unlike some lousy modern movies which depend on the viewer to just pick and choose which scenes are or aren't dream sequences so they can just craft their own headcanon to make the plot somehow cohesive, American Psycho instead challenges the viewer to engage with the film, allowing us, as an outside spectator, to craft for ourselves a determinative view of a unified tale. Just like Taxi Driver! It's a love letter to the lost art of cinema. Then you look at a movie like Pretty Poison. Dennis. Believe me, Dennis. You're going out into a very real and very tough world. Pretty Poison is the story of a mentally ill loner in a society that abandons him and treats him like trash, as if we haven't seen enough of those already. I wonder where they got the idea of having a character take medication. I wonder where they got the idea for this scene, or this scene. And then the main character just opens his mouth and speaks to another character in the story, just like Travis Bickle does in King of Comedy, and they just fucking steal it. And then there's True Romance, which was written by Quentin Tarantino. You know, Quentin Tarantino, the notorious racist who writes himself as a character into his own movies just so he can say the n-word a bunch. Well, he wrote this movie, True Romance, and surprise, surprise, it's a story about a mentally ill loner in a society that abandons him and treats him like trash because the man has no original ideas. And there's a big bloody shootout. I mean, it worked for Taxi Driver, so why not just put it in the movie? And he does this with every movie he makes. He would later go on to make Jackie Brown, in which he cast Robert De Niro, who you might recall was also in the movie Cape Fear, which was directed by, you guessed it, Martin Scorsese, who made King of Comedy. And that's all bad, but he's not the only director to pull this sort of stunt. When Colin Trevorrow was making the new Jurassic World movie, he said this about the new dinosaur, the Gigasaurus. I wanted to make something that felt like the Joker. Now who could he be referring to but Travis Bickle, who's introduced to us in his first scene by cracking a joke. How's your driving record? It's clean. It's real clean, like my conscience. Many films would go on to emulate this style of writing, portraying their main character as a joker of sorts. But let's take a closer look at this opening scene, really dissect the intricate pieces at play. And this particular clip has a little commentary from the uploader. He prefaces this, he says, Here we see the art of movie making at its very best. The first scene draws the viewer into the story and also introduces us to the main character. This is the only movie that does this. <laughs> You see, <laughs> Taxi Driver is the only movie that does this. It's the only movie that, that pulls it. This is the only movie that introduces the main character like this.
<laughs> in the openings. We see in this scene that Travis is applying for a job. He's wearing a jacket with his name on it, and he cracks a joke, but the interviewer doesn't get it. Are you gonna break my chops? No trouble with guys like you coming in and break my chops all the time. If you're gonna break my chops, you can take it on the arches right now, you understand? Sorry, sir, I didn't mean that. This is a recurring theme throughout the film, Travis trying to inject levity into a conversation only to be met with humorless confusion, a subtle representation of his role as a social outcast. He wants to bring joy and laughter to the world, but finds that he's at odds with the society that he lives in. Kinda reminds me of another movie that came out a few years ago. A certain comic book movie. A movie featuring, oh, I don't know, a Joker? Sneakers. I'm talking, of course, about Black Panther. This film tries to trick us by race-swapping the lead, appropriating a black actor into a white role. That actors of color are being forced into white roles is colonization at its core, but what's worse is how the plot of Taxi Driver is colonized by this movie. The main character predictably has girl troubles, and fights crime at night using gadgets, as well as having scenes in cars that take place on the streets at night. Again, it's a little on the nose. But this isn't exactly Disney's first foray into blatant content theft. Take the Star Wars movies, for example, starring Adam Driver. Yes, Adam Driver. Sound familiar? It should. Adam Gerstle was the visual effects designer on The Departed, which was directed by the same guy who made Goodfellas, one Martin Scorsese. Why George Lucas would choose to write in a character who would name his own son after Martin Scorsese films well, it's not exactly a mystery how this happened. This was all done in 1977, which was, coincidentally, just a year after the release of Taxi Driver. But let me offer you another riddle. <clears throat> I am both the exit and the entrance. I have a knob and also hinges. I am in the front, but I am also in the back too sometimes. What am I? The theme of doors permeates Taxi Driver from front to back. In a film so predicated on the question of identity, the proverbial door represents the transition from one place in life to the next. In this gripping scene, we see our protagonist longing for a life that up until now he believed he could never have. And though he hesitates, struggling with the insecurities heaped upon him, eventually he has to make a choice. He has to take a stand. And at long last, he steps through that door. It's breathtaking, earth-shaking, heartbreaking. Though this relationship eventually crumbles under the weight of societal oppression, class warfare, proletariat. When one door closes, another opens. Actor Robert De Niro reprises this theme in King of Comedy, the spiritual successor to Taxi Driver. It's subtle as ever, but we see consistently throughout the movie the masterful injection of doors into the plot. What would otherwise be a mundane scene about a waiting room is instead elevated into a personal struggle for identity, mirroring Travis's own journey. Rupert is beside himself, ruminating on the doorway before him, the elusive passage from where he is to where he wants to be. It's through the study of these themes that we're able to glimpse the truth behind Rupert's psyche and grasp that which he needs most, a foot in the door. Jerry, seriously, you ever want lunch? My treat. Call my office. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Jerry, you're a prince. But then you get a movie like this, just another blatant ripoff of Taxi Driver that just steals the theme of doors with no reverence for the source material. All the subtlety is gone. They just throw infinity million doors on screen just in case the audience didn't get it. And then there's the stand-up comedy scene. I wonder where they got that fucking idea. For people who thought that Monsters, Inc. was an original story, here's the father. Fucking a bitch, be cool. Tabby, just forget about this. It's nothing. There's so much going on in a scene like this. It's so deliberately crafted, and it's genius to set it in the taxi with all that that represents. The taxi has not one, but four doors surrounding him on all sides. This is script writing 101, people. More doors are better than one. Take, for example, this scene where Rupert's lost in a maze of halls and doorways, desperately trying to find his way to Murray's office. It's like a macro view of the whole film condensed into one power-packed scene. Or this scene where Travis tries to shoot a senator in the face. It's also subtle. It tells the viewer everything while telling them nothing at all. Now I know what you're saying. Hey, hold on. 
I'm still concerned about that jacket thing from earlier. His jacket has his name written on it. How's he getting away with this stuff? And then it's our duty as responsible taxi drivers to point out that this is a different jacket. There is in fact a second jacket with the exact same patches in the exact same locations but without his name on the back so that he can use it while undergoing covert operations. I'm sorry again I cannot send you my address like I promised to last year but the sensitive nature of my work for the government demands utmost secrecy. Moreover, the absence of his name on the jacket represents the erasure of his identity. It is a reality unto itself, the psychopath's second coming. But then they say, okay, I can accept the jacket thing, but when the police find him, he still has an incredibly identifiable haircut and matches the description of the guy who attempted to kill Palpatine earlier that same day and is a known entity to his campaign staff. Like, they know his name, jacket or not. This is what we in the industry call dreamlike logic. There's no dubstep in this movie. There's no rap music. It's no wonder you dumb idiot children don't get it. There's no trap beats or Swedish writers. It's all written by Martin. It's written by... It's written by this guy. But none of these three guys are from Sweden, so it's okay. You don't get this level of originality from other directors, other artists. When you watch a Scorsese film, you know that you're getting something unmistakably unique and not some con job replica of another person's movie. It's hard not to feel that Hollywood is dead and that we are the pallbearers. But films aren't the only medium safe from plagiarism. Check out this Joker. How's your driving record? It's clean. It's real clean, like my conscience. This is a song called Map Your Psyche, and if you listen closely, it sounds almost identical to this scene from Taxi Driver. How's your driving record? It's clean. It's real clean, like my conscience. Are you gonna break my chops? You don't trouble with guys like you coming in and break my chops all the time. If you're gonna break my chops, you can take it on the arches right now, you understand? Sorry, sir, I didn't mean that. Are you gonna break my chops? Don't trouble with guys like you coming in and break my chops all the time. If you're gonna break my chops, you can take it on the arches right now, you understand? Sorry, sir, I didn't mean that. Do you hear the similarities? The only difference is like the music in the background. Adding insult to injury, the rapper, or should I say crapper, who made the song is called Bus Driver. How'd you fuck that up? That's the wrong vehicle. How do you, on one hand, shamelessly copy off of Taxi Driver, but then somehow mistake this for this? Like, did you even watch the movie? But what's worse is the guy who made this song, well, the guy who made him also made a movie, Crush Grove, which was released in theaters. I'm sure it's just a coincidence that both King of Comedy and Taxi Driver were also released in theaters. Crush Grove is a 1985 American musical comedy drama musical comedy drama and this guy this guy he he actually went and named his kid reagan they say life imitates art and this has never been truer than in the case of taxi driver we live in a society today where comedians are now commonplace and any amateur off the street can pull their phone out of their pocket and play taxi driver but few fans really have what it takes to pull that trigger. Ronald Reagan was two months into his presidency when John Hinckley Jr. drew a $29 handgun. In 1981, a fan of the movie, a fan of Taxi Driver, attempted to assassinate the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, having been inspired by this scene in the film. Reagan truly was the Palpatine of the 80s, and John Hinckley Jr. thought that by shooting him, he would impress actress Jodie Foster, like Travis Bickle did in the movie. And, and this is actually real. The, reading from Wikipedia, Hinckley became obsessed with the 1976 film Taxi Driver, in which disturbed protagonist Travis Bickle plots to assassinate a presidential candidate. He also developed an infatuation with Jodie Foster, who played Iris. Well, needless to say, this plagiaristic little stunt failed because this man was a fake fan. If he were a true fan of cinema, he would have known that it was actually Betsy who was impressed when he killed Palpatine and not Jodie Foster. Within moments, the limo sped away from a scene of chaos. Hinckley was buried under a mountain of Secret Service agents. Luckily, he's dead now, though I, I don't know why they buried the Secret Service guys with him. Well, I guess they were ripping off of these guys. The case of John Hinckley Jr. is far from unique, in part due to its derivative nature and in part due to human nature itself. 
From the piss-flavored streets of New York City to the dusty Lone Star State, it seems that everybody wants to be the next Travis Bickle. But first up, four, two men are dead following a shooting outside of a bank on the south side. Police Chief William McManus says it happened as a man was withdrawing money from an ATM. This particular story comes from San Antonio, Texas, and predictably showcases a lot of elements that we're familiar with. Happened at about noon on Southwest Military Drive near Marbach. The chief says the victim who is withdrawing the cash was approached by a man who tried to rob him. He says there was a second suspect in a nearby car. The man at the ATM then pulled out a handgun and shot both suspects. The nature of this situation goes far past the point of coincidence and into the realm of plagiarism that we've become acquainted with. A man with guns shooting criminals like some sort of vigilante? It was a robbery that didn't go well for the robbers, and uh, we are interviewing the, the... They don't show us a picture of the shooter in this clip, but I think I can imagine what he was wearing. Probably one of these bad boys right here if I had to take a guess. I mean, they are on sale right now. You can, you can grab one, too. Why not? Check out this product description. Robert De Niro Jr. is one of the most influential film actors in the American film industry. He is known for his fine acting abilities within the character, and he never misses the edge to give his best. <laughs> what? Did I fucking write this? He has already worked in hundreds of super hit movies, but here we are talking about his movie Taxi Driver and the classy Robert De Niro green military jacket he wore in the movie during a scene. Yeah, just one. <laughs> just the one scene. But back on topic, the comment section for this news clip here is really astounding. We're going to look at a few of these comments and you tell me what it reminds you of. Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore, who would not let... Listen, you fuckers, you screwheads. Here is a man who would not take it anymore, a man who stood up against the scum, the cunts, the dogs, the filth, the shit. Here is someone who stood up. Here is... This is the way. The influences here are obvious. All of these people clearly watched Taxi Driver and are just trying to emulate its themes with no respect for its substance. They talk a lot about justice. Oh, th those guys got what they fucking deserved. But they themselves are the thieves. They are the robbers. And they probably don't even realize it. People, people like this probably go around shooting people and they're like, oh wow, look at me. I'm just like falling down. I'm just like Nightcrawler. Fuck off. A situation like this really shouldn't surprise us, though. The movies we watch leave an impression on us, especially when paired with an impassioned performance like De Niro delivers. We give all we have to the films we love, the actors and actresses slowly turning obscenity into poetry. They shape not just our view of cinema, but our view of the world around us, the culture that envelops us, and the way we live our lives. So in conclusion, Taxi Driver is a masterpiece. It changed storytelling as we know it, shaped the mold by which we craft the shape of film to come. It's both a monument of a bygone era and the progenitor of progress incarnate, a movie that wakes us from our cinematic slumber and dares us to dream again.